Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Church. We are glad that you are here with us. Since we didn't gather last week, let me say Happy New Year. And uh, I invite you to stand with us. If you're able to, we're going to lift up our voices to the Lord as we begin our time together. Thank you. 
would you ask that you would hear us as we cry in our worthlessness. And we stand on that promise that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We stand on your faithfulness, and we give you all the praise. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning once again, and welcome, a special welcome to those that are watching online. It's a new year. There are a bunch of new things here happening in the church, and I'm going to invite Pastor Eric to come on up and give us an update on stuff that ended last year and stuff we're looking forward to this year. Thanks, Paul. Good morning, church. Good morning. Happy New Year to you. We weren't able to say that last week, so a uh, happy new year. Welcome to uh, visitors, a special welcome to you as well. I just want to highlight a couple of things for you this morning. The first being a new ministry that we're starting up here in 2024. Uh, we're calling Focus. And the purpose of Focus is to, to rein in, to, to, to move down in, uh, to see specific cultural trends, cultural topics, and, and how they pertain to us as believers. Things like, what is biblical community? Technology. How is it a tool that we can use to honor and glorify God? Things like that. And, and the hope is that by, by reining in, by, by dialing in on these things, we can have a better understanding of how they aid in our Christian living. And so uh, this, this uh, ministry is catered to families, but not just families. So, so we're going to be looking at these topics from a, a family lens, uh, how it relates to parents, grandparents, young ones, teenagers, all alike. Uh, but if you don't happen to fit that demographic, we still would love for you to come because it's going to be really informative and, and help to, to perhaps answer some questions that you have on those things. So the first topic that we have, we're going to be focusing on community. What is community? How are we called to live in community? Uh, and how is that something that we see in Scripture? So uh, come out to that. Our first one is uh, January 28th. It's a Sunday night from 5 to 7 p.m. Uh, come on in. We'll feed you. We'll play some sort of silly game, which will be really uncomfortable for some of you, but that's okay. Uh, and then we'll have this time of teaching and breakout discussions. So uh, we invite you to come for that. Um, all other events on that Sunday night will be canceled. Uh, in the hope that we can get students and other adult classes and small groups uh, to come out. So we invite you to that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to share with you um, is regarding how we kind of ended the year in 2023 financially as a church. Uh, so right before the holidays, uh, we stood up here a few different times uh, and challenged you to consider, to prayerfully consider what giving looked like for you. We're in a little bit of a deficit as a church uh, and uh, the ask was to pray. Uh, pray that God would continue to provide for our needs, which he always does. And then how can you be a part of that? Um, because at Grace here, we're not, we're not people that, that overly talk about giving. Uh, we don't talk about how that is uh, something that we, don't, we just don't want you to feel pressured into that. But it is for us here an act of worship. Uh, just like singing songs and and fellowshipping with one another, giving back of what gave up, God gave us is a part of our act of worship. Uh, and so I uh, just wanted to report in after the end of the year, uh, we actually did meet budget by God's grace and, and his provision. Not only did we meet budget, but we, we have a little extra that came in, about $5,000 uh, in additional additional funds. So praise be to God uh, that he is the sustainer and did provide in that way. Um, we don't talk about it a lot, but we do want to make it easy for you if you feel compelled to want to give. Uh, and so uh, you'll see uh, on the back of the chair in front of you, we've put a QR code, uh, not meant to be peeled off, not meant to be played with, but just as a resource for you, uh, if, if giving online would be a help to you, you can just snap a picture of that code and you can, uh, that takes you to the website and you can give that way, uh, again, as an act of worship, which I'm looking forward to continue doing with you today. Thanks so much. We always like to take opportunities to hear from, um, obviously, our missionaries. We've, we, we make sure that that's a, a, a thing that we do on a monthly basis. 
But every once in a while, we have the opportunity to hear from uh, some of the individuals within the church and the story of their lives and how God has worked in them and what he's doing right now. So I'm going to invite Dave Milne to come on up. Dave's been a longtime friend of the church, and uh, he's been back for a little bit, and he's going to share a little bit of his story and how God has moved in him. And then he's going to read scripture for us. So if you have your scriptures, Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, after we hear Dave's story, and then he's going to read that for us. Thanks, Paul. So I'm not a missionary. Maybe I am from Hawaii. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, Pastor Lou uh, asked me to come up and speak to you and, and take, walk you through, uh, take you back in time a little bit, uh, specifically back to uh, October 4th, 1997, 26 years ago. Yes, I am that old. Uh, to a time where I was struggling, uh, before I was a Christian, I was struggling uh, with the pressures of everyday life and uh, being a provider for my family. I had uh, one daughter already born, just purchased the house. Uh, Victoria was, was ready to be born, and we haven't even thought of the drummer yet. He was still a long thought, <clears throat> my son. But uh, I was, couldn't sleep and uh, was down flipping through the TV, and I stumbled across this advertisement, or it, I don't even know, maybe it was an infomercial or something like that, but it struck me and really grabbed me because it was a bunch of men uh, worshiping God and praying and, and, and just singing to God and, and crying. I'm like, what is going on here? Wow. So it drew me in. I looked at it, and I was just, I couldn't flip the channel. I just kept watching for a few more minutes. And then um, after that went away, uh, I went to the computer the next day uh, and did, this is the uh, a, uh, dial up, so it took me a while to log on back then. <laughs> it wasn't instant, it took me probably five, 10 minutes to get a signal. And get, anyway, I logged on to look to see where uh, this event was gonna take place next. And, and the group was called, uh, it was a, a movement called Promise Keepers, and uh, kind of similar to, it's no longer around, but similar to what we have today, Iron Sharpens Iron. Basically promoting men to be uh, better husbands, better fathers, uh, and, and Christian and build your faith kind of thing. So I uh, went and looked, and there was no event around New England. So I go, I guess I'm not going to go. I guess that's not going to happen. Oh, well, and off I go to the next thing. And um, fast forward a couple weeks, uh, and, I, and I come from a law enforcement background. My, my good friend, one of my best friends, was um, graduating a police academy down in New Jersey, struggled a lot with back problems. It was a real struggle for him to even get to the graduation. So I called him up. I said, hey, I'm coming to your graduation. He said, terrific. He said, I'm having a party right after. I said, great. And we had both had a mutual friend who was a Christian, a Jersey State Trooper named Chris. Actually, he spoke here um, years ago. And um, Chris, uh, I said, is Chris going to be at your graduation party? He said, no, no, unfortunately, he won't be there. He has to attend uh, an event with a bunch of guys from his church. I said, oh, really? What event? He said, well, it's this group called Promise Keepers. They're all going to D.C., Washington, D.C., the next morning, and they have to leave early in the morning. And I said, oh, wow. I said, I, said, I know about that group. I, I stumbled across them. Do you think they have room for me? He said, give him a call. So I said, hey, Chris, you have room, one more spot on that van? That group you're going with down to DC, you know, you know that group that makes you a better man, better husband? He said, of course we do, brother. In fact, I've been praying for you. So um, trying to keep it together, so bear with me here. So. Um, I went to the graduation party, and uh, at the time, I wasn't drinking caffeine or coffee. It was very sensitive to it. I didn't start drinking coffee until COVID, crazy enough, right? So I go to this graduation party, and I drink Coke, and I drink a lot of Coke, and a lot, and some more. So the party was over. Um, we go back to my father's house where we were staying. I'm there with my wife. We go to bed, and I'm doing one of these deals, looking all over. I can't sleep. And I'm thinking, well, I got to get a couple hours sleep because this is going to be a long day, and my friend is coming to pick me up at 4 in the morning, and 
I just have to get some sleep. Well, don't you know, the enemy starts whispering in my ear, you don't need to go. Stay here and sleep. Stay in your bed. Right? That's the kind of things the enemy does to us because the enemy knew what was about to happen. He didn't want me to go. So I said to myself, I made a commitment to my friend. I commit. I said, I will go with you. They're expecting me. I'm going. Sleep or no sleep. So I decided to get up, get dressed, and go outside and wait for him because uh, I wasn't sleeping in the bed anyway. I was just irritating Amy, my wife. Oh, let me back up real quick. She said, where are you going in the morning? What you, what's this you're going to? What? I go, well, I really don't know completely, but it's supposed to make me a better husband and a better father. She says, go. <laughs> Please. No promises. So um, I'm out there waiting for my buddy to pick me up, and I'm literally out walking the sidewalks like this, trying to, you know, I'm wide awake, wearing off that caffeine, and my buddy pulls up, I jump in his, his uh, truck, and he's got the Bible on the dashboard, and he says, hey, how you feeling? I said, I'm feeling great. He said, let's pray real quick. So we pray, meet up with the guys from the church, we all hop in the van, off we go, three-hour drive to D.C. We get to D.C., we have to park outside the city. I'm giving you the cliff note version. If you want to know more after, we can talk more details later, but... Um, we outside the uh, city, cut, caught the subway in, and we get there. And this particular event was supposed to be the all-encompassing, real, really big event where there was like a million men uh, thereabouts. And it, it felt like it. There, I could not believe the amount of men that were there on the Washington Mall um, overlooking the, uh, the monument and, uh, and the, whole, the whole mall there. And... Uh, you talk about God taking me out of my comfort zone. I don't like crowds to begin with. I like my space, you know, as I'm sure some of you do. But now I'm forced to, like, we had to, like, in order to stay together, you know, hold on to each other like kindergartners, you know. And we only managed to keep five or six of us in one area during the event. Found a little spot, and then um, the music starts. And that's the other thing. The Lord used music. Obviously, it's part of me. I played hands all my life. And the Lord used the music to get through and soften my heart, which is why we sing worship. So it, it's, it speaks to us, and God speaks to us in different ways, many different ways. So um, I was like, wow, I never knew church music sounded this good. I was used to just a traditional organ, you know, pipe organ. And, man, they, they brought some serious music. They brought some of the finest names and finest musicians uh, to sing Christian, Christian music and praise the Lord that day. And I was like, in awe. And then the speakers get up there. And again, same thing, top-notch, top-quality speakers in the, in the Christian movement. And they spoke truth to power. And two things that stuck out that they said to me that I feel it was direct, directed right at Dave Millen was that, you know what? God doesn't make mistakes. And there are no coincidences when it comes to God. And I was like, wow. And shortly thereafter, um, they gave the message of salvation. It gave me the opportunity, you know, that, uh, to get on my knees and ask Jesus into my life and make him my savior. But God knew that it took me to be with a million million other men, strangers, to humble me. And that music to break, down, break me down, soften my heart to be able to receive him. Now, once I did that, I'm not saying it's all peaches and cream and life got better, you know, never any challenges or any of that. No, of course not. There's challenges. But now the difference is I don't do it alone. I do it with him. So, after this, this tremendous transformational thing happened to me, I was like, wow, what just happened? Crazy. Like, I had all these emotions going through me. And that moment when I was down on my knees, it was like the Lord spoke to me through playing back a video of my life. 
from the time I could remember. And it was like a, a motion picture. It was like pictures of my life. It was like, remember this? Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Well, that was me. That wasn't you that did that. That was me. Remember this when you almost died? Yeah. I saved you. It wasn't you. It wasn't your friend. It was me. He was letting me know that he was real at that moment. So we got up, and, and as the place was wrapping up, strangers would come up to me hugging me because they knew I just accepted Christ. I'm like, okay, all right. <laughs> Not into hugging, you know, strangers, okay. But they were so happy and filled with joy of the Lord, and I didn't quite understand it at that point. Um, as we were leaving, going back to the subways, Imagine this, a million men in, in a small area trying to get all in the subways at the same time to get out of the city, to get back to our buses and vans. Uh, there was a small group of men. I was down into the subway entrance, a tunnel. Both the inbound and the outbound exit of the tunnel were filled with men, you know, 20 across. It was crazy. <clears throat> and um, as we were waiting for the subway to open, a small group of men down along the tracks started to sing Amazing Grace. Yeah, right before that, I started to doubt. Like, is God real? This, this can't be real. God has so much love, grace, and mercy. <sighs> can't be. And then, the group of men started to sing, and then it filtered its way up. And then soon, blocks away, you could hear men singing in unison, in a cappella, Amazing Grace, like I've never heard it before, ever. It was like the Lord was saying, you believe me now? It's like the... Uh, commercial. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I got you. And then uh, the subway showed up, the doors opened up, and two college-age young ladies get off at the tracks, and they're like this. <laughs> and they just stand there for like 30 seconds, felt like forever, paralyzed, trying to understand what they were witnessing, what was going on. And slowly but surely, the men in the middle started to part, like Moses parting the Red Sea, and the young ladies start walking up through this group of men, singing Amazing Grace. And as they were doing that, tears coming down their eyes. Because at that moment, their life was changed also. So the Lord is great. His love is never ending. No matter, I share this with you today. No matter what you're going through, maybe you're questioning, maybe you're struggling, maybe you haven't accepted the Lord. But if he's pulling on your heart, you have the opportunity today to get on your knees and ask him to be your personal savior, like he did for me. Um, just real quick, after that, and I gotta wrap this up because we, we'll be here all day, and this is supposed to be the Cliff No version. Uh, I came back, my wife is like, what happened to you? It's like, I don't know. I don't know, but I know the Lord, and that's all about all I know. And, uh, and she ended up walking, taking a walk on the road with this crazy lady that lived up the road named uh, Debbie Miller. Pastor Lou's wife. So the Lord provided someone in my wife's life to answer questions. She said, my, my husband went off to this place called Promise Keepers. I don't know anything about it. And she says, oh, Amy, you have to come to our church. And I don't want to steal Lou's thunder, but he'll, he'll talk about it when his message comes. So thank you for allowing me to share. Let's turn to uh, Romans 9, verses 14 through 18. And the Lord says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. 
And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human, human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. May the Lord bless this reading. Dave mentioned in his story that hearing the music and the worship really impacted him and softened his heart so that he could receive what God had for him that day. And I want you to know that as a worship team, that's what we pray when we get up here, that as we worship with you, as you sing the truths about God and who he is, that God would soften our hearts. As we just sang earlier, show me who you are, open up my heart, make my heart like yours. So as we stand together now, I just want to pray that you would choose to make God your firm foundation too, as we trust in him and who he says he is. Let's stand together.
why we are here this morning to worship you and your holiness. We thank you so much for leading Dave Milne to yourself so many years ago and for even this week in the hospital as I spoke with a man named Kim Mason that he surrendered his life to you. We thank you for your mercy and may we learn more about it as we look into your word in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's better. It's on. It's on. <clears throat> the skeptic H.G. Wells said that the world is like a great stage production produced and managed by God. And as the curtain goes up, all is lovely to behold. The characters are beautiful to the eye and to the ear. And all goes well until the leading man steps on the hem of the leading lady's dress. And he then trips over a chair and knocks over a lamp, which pushes over a table into the sidewall. That knocks over the back scenery onto the very heads of all the actors. And chaos is created on stage. Meanwhile... Behind the scenes, God, the producer, is frantically running around to and fro, pulling strings and shouting orders, trying desperately to restore order to the chaos. But alas, poor God, he can't. He said this is the God of the modern man, a very little, limited God. See how that compares to these scriptures, Isaiah 46, 9 Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times, things not yet done. Job 23, 13, but he is unique, and who can turn him, and what his soul desires that he does. Job 42, 2, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. The Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the people. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. Now, which description of God matches yours? Who rules this world? Is it humankind or is it God? The sovereignty of God, which means God rules over everything, is a rejected doctrine today. Humanity has grown so knowledgeable that they think they're more powerful than God himself. The denial of God's control started and originated with Satan himself, who then, because of his pride, influenced Adam and Eve and convinced them to listen to their heart rather than to their creator. Do you really believe that you're the master of your fate? You really believe that you are totally free? Did you choose who your parents were? Did you choose where you were born or the color of your hair, at least when you were born? <laughs> the height of your stature? Do you have the power to stop accidents and to reverse illnesses that are threatening your loved ones this moment? It's time for us to take a reality check and to put ourselves in our proper place. And nothing aids more to meaningful worship than to understand that your very breath is controlled by God, your very next breath. With all the evidence we see in Scripture and all the collective evidence of our experiences about our lack of control, we still have trouble accepting that God is sovereign and that we are not. In fact, the readers of this book, the book of Romans, have the same problem we have. They couldn't believe it either. And they ask the same question. And that question is, is God fair? If we don't have total freedom and total choice, then is it fair that God finds anyone guilty? And so in verses 14 through 18 of chapter 9, Paul begins to answer that question through the imagery of a potter. Now, potter is not mentioned in that paragraph, but it is in verse 21, the next paragraph, and they're connected. This is all part of one big explanation. 
And so verses 14 through 18 begin, introduce the subject of the potter by presenting three declarations regarding the ultimate freedom and total fairness of God. So let's look at verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? (laughs) By no means. Now we have to admit that the scriptures claim that God is sovereign over our salvation. You might not accept it, but you have to admit that that's what it teaches. And that's, the, that's where we start. But the next question is, is he just? And the term just is a synonym of righteous, and both the words mean refer to a standard that is set, that is perfectly straight, and that everything else is measured up to it, and that not only is God the standard, he perfectly lives up to it. He keeps, he keeps those standards and never violates them. When the plumb line of justice is laid out, God is perfectly straight. There is no shadow of turning with him. God's absolute straightness means that he can't treat his creation with injustice. Righteousness in Scripture is consistently used to describe how you behave towards other people, and so we see that in God. In Hebrews 6.10, he is just regarding those who are keeping his word. In verse Hebrews 6.10, he will not overlook your work. He will reward it. But he also is just with those who will not keep his word. Colossians 3.25, the wrongdoer will be paid back the wrong he does. And so I think you can all admit we all have a sense of what, of justice in our cracked image. We at least know when we see injustice in others. The problem is we don't see it in ourselves. That's where the crack comes. The question of fairness arises whenever someone makes a choice to favor one person over another. Is it just that God chose Jacob to receive the promises rather than Esau? Has he got the right to do that? This is an old theological dilemma that has caused Christians to divide over the years, and it's that simple question is, do I have total freedom, or does God have total freedom? And Paul answers this question not as we would initially think, but he says, it's none of your business. He says, is God unjust? He uses his famous idiom, me genita, by no means. God forbid. It's impossible for him to be unfair. By his very nature, God is the definition of justice. And the thought of a mere created being like us questioning God's fairness is ludicrous. We don't have the reasoning capacity to even begin to understand all the elements of justice. We don't have all the facts, we can't see the beginning from the end. I mean, have you ever had to do something that your children did not understand and they, they mistook what you were doing and became upset with you? I, I want to share a troubling illustration at first, but it sharply makes the point. Dr. Barnhouse made this comparison over 70 years ago. He tells the graphic story of a little boy about four years old who had had this wonderful little pet, a dog he loved. And one day he heard a shot and he looked out the window to see that his father had just killed his dog. And he ran outside screaming and the father picked him up and tried to console him and he was kicking and screaming and biting and telling him that he hated him and he didn't want anything to do with him. And he wouldn't listen and he couldn't be consoled. And for days and weeks and even years, he lived in his father's house, but he refused to consider him his father. He ate his food, but refused to listen to anything he said. And whenever he had a chance, he condemned him before his friends and told everybody that he was uncaring and unjust and unfair. But as he grew older, he began to read. And he read some newspaper accounts about the history of his neighborhood. And he read about how years before, there was a wild rabid dog in the vicinity. And this was in the days before treatment and vaccinations. 
And the mad dog had bit many of the neighborhood dogs as well as children, and the children died. And so in great pain, knowing the damage that it would do to his own son, the father complied with the law and necessarily dispatched the dog. But it took years for the boy to understand his father's action because of his own ignorance and misplaced values. And we question God's fairness because we don't know what God knows. And we're so pea-brained that we raise our fists towards God and accuse him of unfairness. But how many of us are thankful for unfairness when we're riding down the highway speeding and we pass a car pulled over by the state police who doesn't see us? Suddenly we're kind of glad things are not fair. Now in our previous passage, Paul uses the patriarchs in the book of Genesis to illustrate how God always keeps his promise. So now he continues chronologically to the book of Exodus through the story of Moses and Pharaoh to show us his justice. And in this story that we're about to read, we see the second declaration bolstering God's freedom, that God can show mercy to whoever in the world he wants. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. The word for is a word signaling that he's giving us a reason why he can do what he wants to do. And Paul quotes from Exodus chapter 33 in verse 19, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And the context is very important for us, and so I would like you to turn, if you could, to Exodus chapter 32 that it's important to see these things. And the context is this, if I can catch us up to speed. Moses has gone up onto Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments with the two stone tablets. And he's up there, he's going to be up there for a while, so he leaves his little brother Aaron behind to watch over the people of Israel. And he's up there so long that the people come to him in verses 23 and 24 of chapter 32. And, and they tell Aaron, look, we, we, we want something more of substance to worship here. We're kind of, we've had enough with this spiritual stuff. We need something more tangible to worship. And so they brought their jewelry and he melted it and he turned it into the golden calf. Moses comes down to earth and saw what was happening, and God commanded him, along with the Levites in verses 25 through 30, to kill 3,000 of the Israelites who were still worshiping the false god through sexual things in front of Moses when he came down. And so Moses did what he was told, but he interceded with God and asked him not to destroy everybody, and God could have killed them all justly. And so the situation settles down a little bit, and then God comes to Moses in chapter 33, verses 1 and 2, and he tells him that he favors him and that he's going to rebuild Israel through him. Now what you have to understand is that after seeing God's justice and wrath firsthand, Moses is a little nervous. And so he knew he was a sinner, and and so he thinks to himself, what if God does this to me when I mess up? And so he goes to him in verse 13 of chapter 33, and he says, can you show me a little bit more of your glory? In other words, I, I, I'd like to get to know you a little better before I fall into this deal. And he asks to see God's glory, in fact, in Exodus thirty-three eighteen, because he wants to know more about this God and whether he can trust his promises. Now do you see why Paul quotes this verse? We have been talking about the promises of God and how secure we are if he gives us his promise. Moses was going through the same thing we are. And so he, he quotes this section, but what I want you to see that Exodus 33, 18 through 19 is the original text. Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious and show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Now, Paul only quotes the last part here in Matthew. And if you know the story in the next chapter, God does put Moses in the cleft of the rock 
and his glory passes by, right? And, and it says he's, compa- he's compassionate and he's just and he's righteous, all of these attributes. But the only one that Paul picks up on here is mercy. He's trying to tell us something, that at God's core, he is merciful. And it's his divine right to show mercy to whoever he would like without your permission. Mercy and compassion are sister words. Mercy means to show pity, and it's often used in a salvation context like Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, that God is rich in mercy because of his great love, and he made us alive because of his mercy. The word compassion means almost the same, but compassion emphasizes the feeling. Mercy is the act. Compassion is the feeling. And God demonstrates his sovereign choice by granting mercy and compassion to whoever he desires. It's his right to render judgment on 3,000 sinners and to show mercy to Moses, who is also a sinner, and the other people that didn't get killed. Unless someone object and say, well, see, he, Moses is a better person. That's why God spared him. Don't be so fast. Moses was a great man and became a humble leader of God's, but he wasn't always that, set that way. Maybe you remember when he was living in the house of Pharaoh in chapter 2 of Exodus that he saw an Egyptian beating one of his brethren, and so he secretly killed him and buried him in the sand. He murdered him. He had a sense of injustice, and so he applied a solution, but he didn't do it equitably. If he was fair, he would have admitted that there are thousands of other Egyptians doing the same thing, but he didn't do anything about them, but he picked on, he got one person. And so in this sense, Moses could be considered a little bit nervy to question how God applies his mercy. It wasn't Moses' righteousness that caused God to choose him. God chose to show him mercy because he wanted to. And the determining factor in God's choice is his will. No one coerces him to accept them. At the same time, God's choice is not arbitrary. He's not up there going eeny, meeny, miny, mo. The reality is, people, that every single one of us is guilty before him. And if he exercises mercy, it is totally his choice and not because of anything in you. Election is unconditional. And Paul nails this in verse 16. He says, so then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who is merciful. Both these words, to run and to exert, means to do anything that you think is going to earn you salvation. It is not dependent on that. And Barnhouse nails it in a sentence. He says, it is not of the willer or the runner, but of the pitier. God is the initiator of our salvation. Now, theologically, you need to understand that there's a sense in which mercy is applied to everyone in the universe, or we would all be burned up in the seats that we sit right now. God mercifully does not destroy us when we deserve to be destroyed. But what you need to understand is that mercy applied to salvation is something that God only gives to some. That's the reality of it. Be thankful that he shows as much mercy as he does to all of us here. That I pray that he has given you salvation mercy. And this same subject is illustrated in one of the parables in Matthew chapter 20. Jesus gives the parable of, of the vineyard and the workers. Remember that? The, vine- the, the owner of the vineyard starts the day and he says, I need some workers and I will pay you this much for your labor for the day. And a bunch of people chip in and they start the day early off and they're working. And then at the 11th hour, just before the clock is gonna ring for the end of the day, a bunch of other workers come and he hires them. And then the bell rings and he hands out the money and he gives just as much money to the people that were only there for an hour than he does those who were there for 11 hours. And you can hear the voices that's not fair how can you do that you see labor unions were starting up even back then (laughs) and the lesson of the vineyard owner is this 
I gave you what we agreed upon. It's my vineyard. I can do what I want. It's none of your business what I do with everybody else. Just be thankful you got what you got. And you say, well, I know, I can understand that. No, I don't think, in the spiritual realm, many of us do the same thing. You know, I've heard people complain. You mean to tell me that I have lived my life so nicely all these years and I've followed Christ and then this guy who does whatever he wants and is a liar and a cheat gets sick and on his deathbed, five minutes before he dies, he accepts Christ and he gets in? <laughs> Amen. But isn't that irritating? But what it shows is that people who think that way are putting more, more credit in their exertion than is, they can't do that. They're saying that there's something in me that was better than that person when all along it is God's choice, not what I do or what you do. I hope if you don't learn anything else in this Romans series, it's that you can't do anything to please God. If you please him, it's because he wants you to please him. Well, not only is it God's prerogative to give mercy to whom he wills, this third declaration in verse 17 declares his freedom, that he is free to reject anybody that he wants. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I've raised you up, that I might show my power through you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. (laughs) It's important to observe how Paul answers questions of life. We try to do the same thing. He always goes back to scripture. For the scripture says, which means the Old Testament in this context, and by the way, that's why our main belief as a church is that the scriptures are the final authority in all matters. And that Jesus authorized the apostles to write some more scripture called the New Testament, indicating that when John the apostle died, that power was gone, and we have now once and for all the faith delivered to the saints, and that we have everything that we need to live godly in Christ Jesus. So don't look for another book. Pay attention to the ones we have. We, we can't even keep up with them. And so Paul reaches back into the Old Testament to another illustration, Exodus 9.16, the person of Pharaoh. And we know Pharaoh, he says, I raised you up, put you in power, not that he saved him, but he put him in power for a particular purpose, and his purpose was so that he might show my power and my name. In other words, this this Pharaoh, who was probably Amenhotep in the 14th century B.C., was put into power for the specific purpose of showing how powerful God is to those who love him. He was put in power so that you and I could see how powerful God is. The great song of Moses in Exodus 15 declares what happened here. Moses said, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he's thrown into the sea that Yahweh shatters his enemies. That's something we need to learn. And God's name was known. Later on in Joshua 2.10, when they started invading Canaan, Rahab heard about them in Joshua 2.10. It says, we've heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came from Egypt. God's reputation preceded him. He does all this for our sake. The Pharaoh's hardness allowed God to demonstrate that he's the Lord of the flies. You remember the plagues? Through the plagues, he showed he controlled the flies, the frogs, the rivers, the boils, and even death. Did Pharaoh receive mercy? No. He got what he deserved, justice. This fantastic event in history, the Exodus, exhibits two things for us. It shows the right that God has to demonstrate mercy to whom he will and to harden whoever he wants. Both Moses and Pharaoh were equally lost individuals, and God's plan just lifted up one and destroyed another. Now, the word hardens here is where we get the word sclerosis, And when you read the story about Pharaoh, you find that 
Pharaoh hardened his heart four times, and that God hardened his heart ten times. Harden is the opposite of mercy. Ultimately, hardening means that God does not show saving mercy to the object. And verse 18 concludes and says, So then he, was, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Now I know this is a difficult concept to accept. It's, it's not that Pharaoh was a great guy and God forced him to do these things. I don't want to do this, God. You know, I don't want to be mean. He already was rebellious. God, God purposed to use his rebellion and hardened him even more. He could have melted his heart, just like hopefully he melted some of yours, but he chose not to here. And so we want to be careful not to soften the word harden. It's an active word. It's not just that God allowed him to do what he wanted to do, although that's involved. It's that he wanted a person to do this to show his power, and so he chose somebody who already had it in his heart and let him do it. It was part of his ordained plan. He froze him, so to speak, in his hardness. And so we, we need to be careful that we don't say that God caused Pharaoh to sin. We know better than that. God claims, nowhere claims that he is the author of sin, and he makes it clear that he's not the creator of sin. And so although God does not create evil, he does like to aggravate it a little bit. He does kind of push it along. And so the imagery is not that God made Pharaoh an unbeliever. He already was. He was opposed to God. And God just pushed him a little further. The hardening here is like what we studied in Romans chapter 1 when God gave them over to their reprobate minds. People would not listen, so he said, okay, keep going. I'm not going to stop you anymore. A stick of wax will grow soft in the sun, but as soon as the sun goes down, it starts to harden up again. And God, in his mysterious way, sheds a certain amount of sustaining grace upon everyone, the whole world. He keeps us from doing what we all have in our hearts. But if a certain society of people won't listen to even the basicness of grace, he will withdraw the sun and let them go all the way, and he'll freeze them in their unbelief. Another way in which God hardens is by using the law to irritate people. We saw this in Romans chapter 7. He gives you a standard. He says, don't do this. And what do you do? You do it. It makes you more bitter. And a classic example of this is I want to take from Dave Milne's testimony earlier when he went to Promise Keepers. They met in Washington, D.C. in October 1997. They, they came together, fathers and sons, to declare to each other that they were going to commit themselves to Christ and to be better fathers. What a wondrous thing. But instead of rejoicing, and Dave didn't see this, but in one quadrant of that particular meeting, a group of feminists walked around bare-chested to ear to, in, in the middle of all these men because they were so angry of, at this puritanical promise keepers who wanted to be better fathers. They became more hardened when they saw holiness. You see how it works? And by the way, I preached on this very passage the week after Dave got saved at Promise Keepers, not knowing, I didn't, hadn't even met Dave yet, but I used Promise Keepers at that time as an illustration of this very thing because that's what was happening in the news on that day. And so Dave, I think, believed in the Lord on October 4th, and then I preached that following Sunday. And when he came back, he said to his wife, Amy, that we need to find a church to go somewhere. And so sometime during that fall, I, I used to train horses, and I rode one of my horses down to the Milne's house because they were new in the neighborhood and introduced myself. And at that time, I, I always carried a pistol on my uh, hip because I trained my horses not to be afraid of guns. And so I rode into the yard and introduced myself, and Amy didn't know what to think. <laughs> <clears throat> and so when I left, she called the police. And, uh, and they told her I was just a simple, harmless little old fuzzball. 
and not to worry about it. Consequently, Amy and Dave came to church and the the first time, I believe, and she can correct us, but the first time she was here, I was preaching on Romans 10, 9 and 10, about how being a Christian isn't just something in name. It has to be in your heart. You need to believe inside. And she surrendered to the Lord here on that day in 1997, November 16th. God's word never returns void. Everyone reacts to his truth one way or another. How do you react to it? Does it soften you or does it harden you? We should be learning that God is the ultimate power and that our human background does not matter. As C.S. Lewis reminds us, he said, either a man says to God, thy will be done, or God says, go ahead, your will be done. You don't want that. So what do you do with this truth? Do you feel a tug in your heart to ask God for mercy? If you have a desire to be forgiven, then that's a sign that God is working on your heart because if he were not, you would be coming more angry, which that might be happening too. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins so that he could be merciful to you? Cry out to him now. Ask him to forgive your sins. You can cry out loud if you want to, by all means. This is the ultimate lesson of security. If God has chosen you and you're able to respond by faith, you are eternally secure. Now you ask, why can't God just be merciful to everyone? Why does he have to judge? Why does he have to be like that? I don't like that. Well, if God was only merciful, I want to tell you that the human heart would still find a way to despise him. At the Shepherds Conference in 2004, the late R.C. Sproul shared a story of a time when he was teaching a freshman Old Testament class to 250 students. And Sproul, on the opening day, said, look, there there are going to be three papers and your, your grade is based on it. One is going to be due September 30th, the other October 30th, and the other November 30th. On on September 30th, 225 papers were passed in, but 25 students came to him begging for mercy. They said, please, Dr. Sproul, we didn't budget our time right. We're new to this whole college thing. Can you give us a couple more days? And so he said, okay, I'll give you a couple more days. And they said, thank you, thank you. And then on October 30th, he received 200 papers. 50 students were late. And they came to him and they pled, Dr. Sproul, please, uh, you know, we had midterms, it was uh, homecoming, we had to go home for vacation, we didn't budget our time right, can you just give us a little more time? And so Sproul said, all right, all right, I'll give you two more days. And they said, oh, bless you, you're, you're our hero. He was the hero on campus. On November 30th, 150 turned in their papers, and 100 students were late. Where are your term papers, he asked. And he said, oh, don't worry about it. We'll get it to you soon. And so he took out his little black book, and he said, Harrison, F. What? That's not fair. Johnson, F. You can't do that. That's not fair. It's not just. And he said, you want justice? You didn't pass in your your October paper either. I'm giving you an F on that. What? And the whole class was in a turmoil. He said, anybody else want justice? And he went on to say that if if we experience grace once, we're grateful, we're so thankful. You know, I don't have to serve the sentence. If we experience it twice, we get a bit jaded. The third time, we start to demand it. If God doesn't choose me, then there's something wrong with him, not me. You see, but the definition of grace is undeserved. Rather than asking, why doesn't he save everybody? (laughs) You should ask, why in the world did he save me? You know, there is a way that even as a believer, we can harden our hearts. Israel experienced this in Psalm 95, 7 through 8. After they were delivered from Egypt, 
It says today, if you will hear my voice, don't harden your hearts. And in this psalm, God explains how his own people hardened their hearts. He delivered them miraculously, destroyed the Egyptian army. He fed them for 40 years in the wilderness, met all of their needs, and they still had the nerve to complain about what God does. And so we as believers need to make sure we do not complain when he does so many things for us. And one of the primary reasons why we come together every week is to keep our hearts from hardening. And I hope 2024 will be a time that you make that a priority in your life. How thankful are you for the mercy of God? And how can you better show your appreciation in the days ahead? Well, in the 1800s, a woman actor was walking on the streets of London and, and she heard a beautiful song coming from the window of a house. And it turns out it was a hymn written by Charles Wesley back in the 1700s. And she heard the words and they struck her and she immediately got down on her knees and rethought her relationship with God and she stopped and prayed. And then a couple weeks later, she was going out on stage and the curtain opened and the music prelude happened in which she was supposed to say something and she couldn't say, she couldn't think of what to say, couldn't think of what to say. And then finally when she opened her mouth, she sang the first verse of this hymn. If you could turn to number 189, hymn number 189. And if you read music, maybe you can help me out. <clears throat> this is new to all of us, even though it's 300 years old. Depth of mercy. more than ever this year to appreciate the depth of mercy that you have shown us. That we would not raise our little fists to you, but that we would surrender in the all corners of our lives. But mostly, Lord, if there be anyone here that does not know you, they would just surrender now. That we can rejoice in your choice of them and can help them grow. Be with us in this this year, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.